Playhouse and the resident happened to be participating in the, the women, infant, and children food subsidy program, they can have that test for free. So we, we want to make sure that we do that. In 1985-ish, the Public Utilities Commission set about replacing all of our pipes in the city, those from the meter back to our system, all lead free. So we have no known lead fixtures in our entire delivery system. But it is important that from the, the side of the meter into the building, that that water get tested as well. Um, and that- I, wanna, I, I don't wanna touch off. All right. Go right I, ahead. I think if you could pause your, your presentation, let the lieutenant do it and we can pick up afterwards. I, I, unless there are more questions, I just have a raffle prizes. Because I just wanted you to know your water is safe, uh, we are doing what we can to maintain its quality and safety and public health and that we are in a rate setting process and how you can engage in that is at City Hall when it comes before our commission uh, on April the 10th. If you want to talk about it, learn more about it, yes. Yeah, it's just one in the city, it's a unified situation where everybody is, is, is should comply to a testing of their water pipe and everything else, and, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, I don't know how to use you for that, but you know, everybody together, or all, or have to, they have to go through this process of getting all their water pipes checked, but to make sure that they, the code. I, the, pl the plumbing, uh, uh, the planning department and building inspection um, will do have regulations about that sort of thing. As far as our department, what we target are older homes because we know those, Hundred-year-old homes are more likely okay. to have those issues in their pipes, um, yeah. but the service is available to everyone. Okay. Thank okay. you. Now I'm going to ask my colleague. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm going to ask my colleague to pull two tickets out, so you have to read your number for your modest prize. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. The number is four seven one two six zero seven. Four seven one two six zero seven. You got it. Winner right there. Wow. Winner chicken dinner. Not really a chicken dinner. Wonderful. Okay. Good. There's your modest prize. One more. Under that one. Yes. Okay. The last is four seven one two six zero one. Yes, babe. Winner, winner. Ooh, we have a winner. That's good. That's who? Where? Uh -huh. There you go. Thank My you dear. very much. I, I didn't know. Awesome. Thank you very much. There's a bunch of paper here. I'm going to leave it. Oh, it's, it's. And there's a bunch of calendars. You're welcome, too. Thank you very much. Oh, we got filters. <laughs> Is it a water bottle or a water filter? It's a reusable water filter bottle. Oh, that's a good. Water bottle. Hey, Susan. 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 Oh. So two of the water the right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Um. Wait. 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 <coughs> So if you guys are ready, if everyone's ready, I'd like yes. to begin. Okay. Okay, the first thing I'd like to say, I was a little disappointed. I must confess, I was hoping I was going to win one of the raffle prizes, but you can't always win. Anyway, uh, so to start, I'd like to say, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Lieutenant Tom Harvey. I've been working at Tenderloin Station since October of 2017, so it hasn't been that long, so relatively new to the Tenderloin. However, in my previous work assignments, I can tell everyone that I have spent a great deal of time working in the Tenderloin, in essence, since 2009. So I've spent a lot of time here. I know a lot of the people. I know the area, etc. So I'm happy to be here. And I'd also like to add that Captain Fabry, who's also relatively new to Tesla Station, wanted to attend tonight. However, he had two prior commitments. So I'm here in his stead. And essentially what I'd like to do is uh, spend a little time giving everyone an overview of uh, Tenderloin Station, Police Station operations, make sure everyone knows what's happening. 
down the block at 301 Eddy Street, and also spend some time talking about um, our overall police strategy for the Tenderloin District. And then at the end, of course, if anyone has questions, I'll be happy to field those questions. And if there's something I cannot answer, I will take that with me back to Tenderloin Station to research, and hopefully at a later time, we can get that response back to you, uh, my people. Okay, so a little bit of an overview. Um, so Tenderloin Station uh, has currently a staffing of about 150 police officers. Please don't quote me on that, but more or less 150 police officers. And these officers and patrol sergeants and patrol lieutenants and a, uh, an investigative lieutenant and a captain are responsible for the Tenderloin District, which uh, most of us know is bounded by Mission Street, um, uh, as far north as Geary, right? And uh, we have a day watch platoon, and the day watch platoon, they work from 6 a.m. generally to 4 p.m. We have a swing watch, which is synonymous with like think afternoon and uh, early nighttime, which works from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. And we have a midnight watch, which consists of officers working from 9 p.m. at night straight through to 7 a.m. in the morning. Graveyard shift, I think, is what they call that. And then we have an investigative office where when the cases, there are certain uh, investigative cases that get assigned to our, they call it the station investigation team, they do the follow-up. Generally, as we know, police officers will respond to a call for service or an emergency. They conduct a preliminary investigation. They gather the facts. They speak to witnesses, victims. They attempt to locate a suspect. They make arrests as appropriate. They write up their preliminary report and then it gets presented to the district attorney to decide if they want to file charges on a person. And if there's more follow-up required, it gets assigned to the station investigative team. Uh, and they do things such as locate video cameras, uh, like exterior video cameras in <coughs> stores or businesses or residences, um, and speak to witnesses or locate uh, additional victims so they can put a story together. So I'm telling you information, I'm sure, all of you already know, but I did want to address that. Um, so crime statistics, here we are in March 2018, time keeps marching by, and I can report to you that violent crime in the Tenderloin is down. Violent crime is down, and that is the number one focus of Tenderloin Station right now, to combat violent crime. Uh, auto thefts are down which is a good thing. We constantly hear on the news how auto thefts are a uh, uh, epidemic in the city and county of San Francisco, but as of March of 2018, they're down, which is a good thing. Property crime has increased, which is not good, but what we are doing is we're focusing on the violent crimes. We're responding to the needs of the Tenderloin residents, uh, complaints, um, about criminal activity, and uh, we are always trying to improve all of our stats as best we can, so we'll be looking in the future to modify our strategy so we can have a positive impact on property crimes as well. When I say property crime, of course, I mean your burglary, residential burglary, vehicle, um, simple theft from merchant incident such as those incidents such as those. Um, so those are an overview of the uh, crime stats in the Tenderloin. Um, part of Captain Fabry's strategy, uh, as well as the police management, we have increased, we know homelessness is a problem citywide, statewide, and we know it's a problem right here in the Tenderloin. And we have increased our homeless outreach officers. We now have six Officers were solely dedicated to homeless outreach. And what does that mean? That means they are, when they come to work every day, they respond to the calls of, of homeless issues. They attempt to engage the, the people who are the subject of the calls. They try to offer them outreach services. There's the homeless outreach team. Um, there's shelters. Uh, 
there is an assortment of city services which are offered to uh, those who are residentially challenged. Uh, and oftentimes with movement or if they're able to facilitate uh, uh, a city's hot team, the homeless outreach team, to respond to address the needs of an individual. If there is, you know, we see sometimes there might be uh, uh, an incidental, forgive me for a lack of a better term right now, but if there was like a mess or whatever, we call in Department of Public Works to kind of clean up the area, sweep it up, wash it down, whatever is necessary to restore uh, free movement of the sidewalk for those that, the kids that would go to school in this community, for the residents that live here, and the merchants that work here, and the tourists that come to visit here. Um, we have, uh, we're in an effort to combat the chronic uh, ongoing uh, drug dealing epidemic in the Tenderloin, uh, we have officers who are focusing their efforts on that issue. A tenderloin station receives a lot of complaints from its residents and merchants and visitors regarding uh, those issues with uh, the sales of illegal narcotics. So we're focusing our efforts on making arrests when appropriate and bringing those cases forward to the district attorney's office to make a decision about to charge or to not charge those cases. And then ultimately when they are charged, it, it falls into the hands of a judge to decide how best to proceed, right? And oftentimes we know some some individuals get diverted into a like a diversion pro program, like maybe they need substance abuse help. So those those are mechanisms are in place, and then those who don't meet the criteria for whatever reason will be prosecuted if elected by the district attorney's office and the judges that work at the San Francisco Superior Court of California at 850 Bryant Street. So we're making efforts there, and oftentimes the focusing on drug dealing efforts, a lot of times, you know, people might think of something different when they think of a, a drug dealer, right? But oftentimes they'll have weapons, they have weapons on them because they, they're worried about a rival drug dealer, or maybe they're protecting like an area they want to be like the sole uh, money maker in a given area. So. The reason why I bring that up is to explain that it, there's a trickle down effect, right? Like you might arrest a person who sells illegal narcotics. However, they also might have a weapon, a gun, a, a, a dangerous knife, or whatever. So sometimes you, you can mount one problem, but you're solving other problems simultaneously. And this is all based on the needs of the residents of the Tenderloin. Tenderloin Residents are reaching out to Tenderloin Station, asking for help. I'm not sure if anyone, I'm not a social media person, but SFPD on Twitter, Twitter's the social media application, there's a Tenderloin page, it's called SFPD Tenderloin. And if you look at that Twitter page, you will see the arrests that are occurring daily in the Tenderloin. Has anyone had a chance to look at it? Not yet, okay. Yeah, I didn't even think you had a Twitter page. SFPD Tenderloin. Mm -hmm. It's a great source of information, and you will see the great work that's occurring just down the block. Okay, so I gave everyone an overview. I discussed briefly our plan, our strategy. We're working on combating property crimes, which are up as of this month. I think this would be a good time to take questions from those of you who have questions. Um, domestic violence going down to Okay, domestic violence, okay, they, the way they characterize criminal statistics does, uh, is not on the statute that I have, so I cannot speak. I do not have the answer for that. Um, okay. Are there enough shelter beds in the city to, to, to house all of these people? Are there enough shelter beds? Yes. No. I was going to say, I don't know the answer from a work point of view, but from a San Francisco resident, I can tell you the answer is probably no way, Jose. Right. Well, I don't know. I guess this might be the wrong place to ask this, but I'm going to ask anyway, just because 
So we'll just, do you know anything about what the city's planning to do about that since there are not enough shelter beds? And as everybody says, ten, uh, homelessness is a problem, or actually it was created by the fact that those jobs created because the people didn't, uh, couldn't afford to pay the rents, created because of various reasons. Do, what is, do you know anything at all what, what the city is planning to do about changing this, 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 this eyesore event? Do I know what the city, uh, well I think that this issue is a very, very big issue in San Francisco. We all could agree to that. And everywhere um, else as well. And everywhere else as, uh, as well, that's correct. And then I would like to say that I know City Hall, there's the, off, the Mayor's Office of Supportive Housing. And I know there's the Director of Homelessness. They've hired staff to help address these issues. And in my capacity, I'm not at will to talk politics, and nor would I, but we know from watching TV or reading the newspaper that just about every mayoral candidate has a stance on homelessness and how they would move to correct the issue. And some have discussed permanent housing. They, you know, Some candidates state like we need permanent housing. That's the only way to stop the revolving door of uh, chronic homelessness. If I, but I, I, I do want to caution, I don't want to get too far on this topic because I'm really not qualified in my police capacity to answer those concerns. I, I think it's a say, city hall concern. Tell, um, I've reached out to Commander Lazar, uh, who works um, on homelessness issues in San Francisco, and he's unavailable tonight, um, and I'm, I'm working on trying to get him to come to next month's meeting to give an update on the department's uh, homeless outreach program. Uh, one thing I do know is, uh, based upon information I've gotten um, from City Hall, there is a distinct negative reaction by community residents in every neighborhood the city tries to put a navigation center or a homeless shelter. Everybody agrees, yes, we need the service, just not here put it over there. And the people over there say, no, put it over here. So um, the police have a really hard time because their job is to enforce the law, not make policy. And um, so uh, I, I, what I can do is, we have a part of our program that's called Community Issues. People can bring those to me and we can work on trying to get people to come to meetings further down the line to talk about those issues. Thank you. Yes, yes I want to more on, on, on the police. Yes. Excuse me. I just want to discuss a little more on the police issue right now. Yes. Uh, that's what, I just want to ask you a couple questions, but one of the important questions to me is, uh, there is mental health, a lot of mental health going on. And I, I noticed in the town I was born and raised here, but been through my first year, but I've changed, different things are going on in my life today. It's been going on for quite a while. But I noticed down here, in, and other places, mission and stuff, there's a lot of mental health. And I, I see sometimes the police dealing with mental health. I know their mental health. You know, I guess, I, I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, I've been around enough of it. The mental health people, they don't really mean any harm. They don't even know where to help. They, they don't even know. And I'm wondering if there's any special training in a Tenderloin station to deal with mental health without having to resort to that. So putting hands on to this mental health sure. individual. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's a couple things I'd like to say on that topic. Number one, and this is not always the case, but oftentimes a police response to a mental health crisis is initiated by someone who calls the, they call dispatch, they call 911, and they'll say there's a person in crisis, and they'll explain the circumstances regarding why they are calling. So the police have the responsibility in a community caretaking role to respond and address the issue of whatever is being reported. So they will contact the individual, they'll make an assessment, um, and you know, usually in those cases where it's like a, a, a mental health issue, they'll make an assessment safer. They want to ensure the individual's not um, 5150, for instance, um, and they will you know, make outreach uh, uh, in, the, in the form of say like do they need services or what, what is it that they might need right because a lot of time mental health and homelessness go hand in hand 
So that's one thing. Another thing, I'm kind of bouncing around, but yes, you asked what kind of specific training do, this, do police department members receive for issues involving mental health? Uh,